Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I'm here today at the James Julia Auction House up in beautiful Maine, taking a look at some of the guns that are coming up for sale in their October 2015 auction. And I wanted to start out with this very cool Japanese sort of mortar, sort of grenade launcher. Now, something I personally have been looking into a lot recently, and I think a lot of other people have as well, is World War I. Obviously, we're in the centennial of World War I, and if you look at the trench fighting in World War I, one of the things that most militaries in the world learned from it was that having a light, explosive projectile indirect fire weapon, a trench mortar, was a very valuable tool for a lot of troops. It was capable of doing a lot of things. It really filled this gap between where a machine gun was useful and where proper crew-served artillery was useful. Now, the Japanese, of all people, actually came up with really one of the best iterations of this type of weapon, and that is colloquially known as the knee mortar. Uh, to the Japanese, this was the Type 89 Takidento. Uh, it was considered a grenade discharger. It's actually kind of in this weird zone where it's not really a mortar, because this actually has a rifled bore. But it's not really a grenade launcher, because while it can use modified hand grenades, its typical projectile was actually a specialty propelled unit. Not, not quite a grenade, more like a mortar shell, but not really a mortar, more like a grenade launcher. So I want to take a closer look at this, but I want to start off by pointing out that the Japanese made a lot of these. They introduced them in 1929. They made about 120,000 of them in total. And they equipped troops with these in almost the same numbers as light machine guns. So this was a very important weapon um, to be used by Imperial Japanese Army tactics. The idea was you could use one of these guys very much like a light machine gun. Uh, the, the guys who had these would use them to fix an enemy unit in place, keep their heads down, keep them uh, basically under a suppressive fire, while a second unit of riflemen or, or light machine gunners or another unit uh, maneuvered to get into a flanking position. So very much the way the Germans would use a general purpose machine gun to, to hold a unit down while riflemen moved, maneuvered to expose it. That's how the Japanese used these knee mortars. Now I should also point out the word, the, the name knee mortar is of course an American thing. Um, I've seen some speculation that the, the term actually came from the Japanese description for the carrying bag for these, which went on your leg and could be mistranslated as a knee bag for a mortar. Maybe that leads to the name knee mortar. The most common understood uh, origin of the name is this curved butt plate on the weapon, which a lot of U.S. troops, in this is how the story goes, U.S. troops thought, ah, you put that on the top of your leg and then you fire it. And if you do that, I'm sure it feels fine until you pull the trigger on the thing and then it breaks your femur and does serious damage. Um, from reading World War II U.S. GI accounts, uh, the guys weren't stupid enough to do that. Frankly, any GI who had fired a rifle grenade from their shoulder knew that something this big and heavy out of a weapon like this you did not want to have on your leg. And I don't think that happened very much, despite the stories about it. The idea for this curved base plate was to allow you to dig it into soft ground or fire it from things like roots, trees, logs, whatever happened to be around. This was a very flexible and very quick, quick to use weapon. So why don't we go ahead and bring the camera back here. Let's take a closer look at how exactly this thing worked because it's really quite clever. So there are a couple elements that really distinguish this guy, the Type 89, from a typical light mortar. The first is that it has a rifled bore. You'll be able to see that. Yep. You can see the rifling right in here. Um, a typical mortar does not have that. The other thing that differentiates it is that this is actually not a, uh, well, it's the equivalent of a closed bolt gun rather than an open bolt one. Typically, a mortar will have a fixed firing pin down at the bottom of the tube, and you'll have a primer on the base of your mortar shell, which this did. The primer on this one would be in the middle. It's gone. This is a deactivated shell. But typically, what you do is you drop the, the shell down the tube, and it slides down. When it hits the bottom, that primer fires. And, and it launches the shell. And in order to aim a mortar, what you generally do is you have a pair of legs coming off the front and you adjust the angle of the mortar to where you want to fire. The Type 89 did this totally differently. Instead, it has a range adjusting dial right here. You'll you can see as I turn this dial, 
this assembly moves up and down. That's actually the trigger. And there are two scales on it. So you could fire a standard Japanese issue hand grenade that you could screw a propelling charge to the bottom of. Those had a range of approximately up to 190 meters. That's what the scale goes up to here. Uh, from 40 out to 190. So, you know, that's not, not too bad. However, if you used the purpose-built Type 89 projectile, these are 50 millimeter, by the way, if you use the Type 89, your range actually goes all the way up to 650 meters. That's quite a significant distance. That's definitely light mortar territory. That's beyond rifle grenade. Anyway, in order to change the range, you adjust this dial, and what you're doing is actually moving the firing pin inside the bore. So I can bring it up. In fact, I'll do that. Let me bring it up like all the way. Then to fire the weapon, you put it down, you put the projectile into the mouth. Now because I've got this set to a very short range, this would be 55 meters. The projectile's just barely sitting in there, which means the firing pin's right about here and we have this very large expansion chamber for the propellant gases. What that means is when I fire it, not much pressure is generated. This comes out and just kind of goes plop about 55 meters away. If I expand the range, in fact, let me leave the projectile in here so you can see this. As I lengthen the range, you can see that drops down the bore. Once I'm all the way at the bottom, now I have a very small volume of of, of uh, combustion chamber. So when I fire the grenade, a lot more pressure is generated. The thing goes a lot farther. Uh, this is, take that out. As I said, this is our trigger. It's spring loaded, it's double action. It's actually very stiff, um, which was typical on them. Uh, often you'll see these with a little leather lanyard so that you could get a better grip on it. On a typical mortar, you adjust the angle of uh, the barrel to adjust range. Since we're adjusting range on this through our, our little threaded adapter here, instead, you always fire this at exactly a 45 degree angle. In order to simplify, to, to make sure you're doing that correctly, it has this bubble level clamped to the barrel. Now, the bubble level's down because I'm actually pointing this slightly down right now but there's a little line right there. And when you're at 45 degrees, there's a little level indicator in the bubble that, sh that, that sits right on that line, confirms you're at 45 degrees. You then use this groove on the barrel as your sighting line. Line up, fire. These were particularly effective weapons because they were so light. The whole assembly is only about 10 pounds, so it's about the weight of a rifle. They were carried by men right at the front lines. And in almost any sort of emergency contact, you could pull this thing out and start firing extremely quickly. U.S. troops in the Pacific uh, had the closest thing that, that they had was a 60 millimeter light mortar, which had a base plate and a tube and bipod legs and took significantly longer to get into action. Um, in fact, so much longer that American troops did actually resort to simply carrying the tube and jamming the tube into the dirt or against the log and using it kind of like these. However, they weren't really designed for it and the accuracy was, was far less than the Japanese could get with these knee mortars. Now the projectile itself is kind of interesting. Uh, the front here is full of explosive charge. These were actually, uh, came very close to, to being the equal of the US 60 millimeter mortar in terms of effectiveness. They have a threaded portion at the rear, which comes off. This is where your propellant charge would be. Of course, this is a deactivated shell, so it doesn't have any propellant in it. Now, what's interesting, you can see there are some holes around the circumference of that base, as well as in the bottom. The holes in the bottom uh, vented gas to propel the grenade. The holes in the side actually pushed propellant gas against this copper band, which caused it to expand and grip the rifling in the barrel. You probably saw I was able to slide this in and out of the barrel without any resistance. That's because it's actually undersized until you fire it, at which point this expands so that it can rifle properly. The fuse on these, right here, it's a contact fuse. So pull the pin to, to arm it, and then when it hits something, it detonates. Pretty simple. 
All right, guys, since I've got this thing here, I figure I should uh, pull the table away and show you how it would actually look to use. So I've got my elevation bubble here. I'm going to run this up to a fairly close range, so I'm not dropping the shell way down. Let's say we have an enemy at 75 meters. So what I want to do is run it to right about there. Bubble level says I'm at 45 degrees. Drop my shell in. Use this line on the barrel to check my aiming point, and then boom, fire the weapon. Again, I have a good eye onto my, my level right there. Drop the shell in, fire, and away you go. All you have to do to repeat is take another shell, drop it in, line up, fire. These were very fast and very effective weapons, especially in the jungle. Now, something else to point out, these were also used in a direct fire roll when necessary. At very close range, you could put this up against any sort of horizontal structure, surface, block, whatever, and use them to actually fire through, say, uh, windows of buildings or ports in pillboxes, anything like that. That was also used. Now, well, thanks for watching, guys. I hope you've enjoyed the video. This is, of course, for sale. This is an NFA weapon. Um, it is classified as a destructive device, so you do have to do an NFA transfer on it. But it's coming up for sale here at Julia in October of 2015. If you take a look at the description text below, you'll find a link to their catalog page on it. This is a gorgeous condition one. Uh, it's one of the better ones I've ever seen. So if this is the sort of thing that you'd like to have, um, I think this would be an excellent one for you to take a closer look at. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, learned something new. Tune back in again. We'll have some more cool stuff coming up from the Julia auction.